Legends of angels and saints alike embolden humanity against the night. Yet one legend above all others empowers the people in ways few could imagine before her arrival. The legend's name was Avicen. Unlike the desperation that birthed the four archangels of Innistrad, Avicen was the result of a plan. Her abilities answered issues within the church in such a manner that the humans called them miracles, when in truth they simply fit by design. Welcome to Avicen's Legacy. Within hours of a sliver of the moon itself falling on Thraben, the alerted populace found the unusual being in the vault of the cathedral. Not even magicless Cathars could mistake the presence before them. And soon, the archangels were roused, and the four sisters met the newcomer by dawn's first light. In a manner... Only greater angels can see. Each of the sisters peered into the soul of the angel who called herself Avison. And to their surprise, Avison peered into them as well. The origin of Avison was uncertain, even to the angel herself. She simply knew her purpose in this realm, and that she had a duty given to her by her father. As the archangels could see into her soul, they knew her intent was pure. Avicen was accepted into the ranks of the church. It was not unheard of to have a new angel naturally come into being due to the prayers of the people. Yet those angels were always minor beings, easily accepted into the ranks of one of the four flights. Avicen, on the other hand, radiated power that not even an archangel could achieve. These sisters quickly agreed that none of them had the right to lead the being before them, and so Avicen was given the space to create her own flight within the church. Her flight came to be known as Avicen's host. Her and her host quickly proved their worth to not only the sisters, but the entire world. As Avicen's host reached out across Innistrad, their miracles established churches in lands long opposed to the worship of angels. All the while, Avicen herself was seen on the front lines, slaying the foes of humanity. Even fully grown demons, which an archangel would struggle against alone, were cast down with disdainful ease by this guardian. The humans found reason to believe in Avicen because of her strength, and when they did, they were shocked to find themselves empowered with newfound abilities. Each time a faithful would kneel in prayer to the new archangel, Avicen would actually hear them, their pleas soon to be answered by her benevolence. Sometimes it was answered by one of her host being sent to aid. Other times, if it was truly dire, Avicen herself would appear to crush the darkness. However, her most common answer was to use the ability given to her by her father, the ability to make manna from faith, returning the prayer in kind in the form of white manna. It did not take long for the very real effects of these prayers to become known. Almost the entirety of humanity turned to worship the newest archangel of the church in return for the power to defend themselves. No longer were the humans common weaklings, praying each night to see the morning. No longer were the Cathar little more than sacrificial watchmen, who bought time for the angels to arrive. No longer were the priests helpless as the wards of their village began to fail. Humanity, through Avicen, 
became a race of frail but defiant sorcerers. With the lives of their charges changed so drastically, even the angels began to pray, their earnest faith being rewarded as if they were mere humans bowing their heads in prayer. In no quiet manner did the balance of Innistrad change from this. Vampires, for the first time, spoke the names of their hunters in fear rather than in jest. The hordes of the walking dead were finally laid to rest by angel fire, while the necromancers themselves found their doors broken in by wrathful Cathars, those who no longer were afraid of what would be found within. Werewolves began to find the villages of Kessig walled with magic that burned to the touch. All the while, the faithful within strengthened the wards with each sunrise. Even demons began to mention Avison's name in fear, as even the weakest of angels now could stand as a threat to them alone. In the same manner that humanity viewed angels, Avison herself was viewed in a detached and awe-inspiring way by the angels themselves. When even the archangels bowed in prayer to Avison, the angel of hope was raised to a new standard. No longer a mere archangel, now more comparable to a god, as the very church that ruled humanity became known as the Church of Avison. With her newfound authority, Avison was quick to chastise the archangel she had come to argue with many times in the past. The newfound leader saw the enemy as something that must be exterminated, while Liza saw their enemies as more than just monsters, and hoped that someday they could be brought into the church as allies. After much debate, Avison allowed Liza's work to continue. However, there was one condition. For no reason were she again to work with demons. As the darkness of Innistrad was pushed back, there was something else that found home in the now empty lands. Without werewolves, vampires, or even the undead to drive them off, demon kind began to make themselves known in far greater numbers. Their hellish gates found secretive places to tear open the earth, and the flights, now accompanied by the empowered Cathar, waged war against the demons, even pushing back their oldest enemies. However, as Avison herself struck down one demon after another, she slowly began to recognize the faces before her. While the church did seem to be winning, the demons never ceased in their tides. When a demon who towered above the trees attacked a city once again, Avison became certain that slaying the demons was not enough. And in truth, she was right as each being of pure black mana slowly reformed into the same demon killed once before, the portals quickly returning the creature to the bloodshed that those demons reveled so deeply in. With her realization, Avison gave the church a new proclamation. What cannot be destroyed will be bound. With chains of enchanted silver, Shaped after Avison's own spear, humanity subdued one demon after another, and the success became known as Avison's Collar, a symbol that came to represent Avison herself. The black beings the church fought became rarer, as each captured demon never seemed to be replaced. However, Avison was not satisfied with simply jailing these beasts, deciding to finally reveal to the church the purpose of the moonstone her father had created. 
escorting the restrained demons to the now-named Avison's Cathedral in Thraben. Avison herself taught the magics needed to the highest priests and her angels. With the completion of the ritual, the demon would be absorbed into the stone itself, trapping them in a realm of isolating darkness, with nothing but time and their own thoughts as companions. The other creation of Sauron became known as the Hellvault, as within a few decades, almost the entirety of demon kind was imprisoned in that silvered blackness. In a reversal of history, the last bastion that demonkind held on to was the isolated chasm of Ashmouth. The lord of the largest pit of Innistrad was known as Shilgengar. Unlike other portals, when a demon was taken away in chains, here a new face would rise to take their place. Shilgengar, the lord of Ashmouth, was no ordinary demon, as you might recognize his name. Back when a voice whispered promises to Edgar Markov, when the cost to create immortality was to slay the angel Marisaz, his name was spoken in the dying rambles of that betrayed angel. Unbeknownst to the world, Shilgengar drew power from every life ended by a vampire. Each time a vampire came to feed, so too did Shilgengar. A fair compensation for the demon who directed their creation. Despite drawing power from all the vampires of Innistrad, Shilgengar was only barely able to outpace the church's ability to capture demons. The fact that Ashmouth's ranks shrank slowly did not go unnoticed by the Archangel Liza, as the Church continued to wage war on their ancient enemies. Liza watched as year after year the cost of containing this pit came in the stacking bodies of both faithful Cathar and dutiful angels. Despite the power of Avison strengthening the Church, and Avison herself fighting on the front lines. There was no end in sight for this war against darkness. Liza, after decades of conflict, slowly decided that the war itself had come at a cost too great. This was not a conflict to save a village, nor was it a battle to defend a city. The church had rallied and conquered the lands so thoroughly that this war was no longer for survival, but a battle to extinguish demonkind itself. It did not sit well with Liza to be preparing the same blow that demonkind had prepared all those years ago. She found no joy in revenge. She found no satisfaction in victory. Eliza simply saw the fear in the demon's eyes as they saw their own end approach. All the archangel found within herself was pity. After one of the countless battles, the flight of dusk escorted the new prisoners on the long journey to the Hell Vault, a fact Liza took advantage of as she landed before the demon who had once commanded the legion chained behind him. In a twist of fate, the archangel held before the demon a contract. If he were to sign it, he would go free. But as with every demon's contract, Liza's deal came at a cost. Knowing what awaited him in the Hell Vault, the demon signed the dotted line with the name... Grizzlebrand. Liza's spear broke the chains that held the demon to the prisoners behind him, letting the convoy continue on to Thraben, as Liza tasked a few angels with ensuring Grizzlebrand journeyed straight home to Ashmouth. Shilgengar had been surprised by the return of one of his captured generals, and even more surprised when he was told of how Grizzlebrand escaped. 
part of the angel's terms required a meeting between Shilgengar and Liza. While Liza had made contracts with minor demons and small-time pit lords before, those deals had fallen silent ever since Avison's rise to power, despite quite a few demons trying to build that old connection. Yet, here it was, both a golden opportunity to save Ashmouth and a galling insult that Liza sought to bend him to her will. With few other options left to him, Shilgengar agreed. A contingent of the Flight of Dusk held one of the few mountain passes into the Ashmouth. For the first time in decades, the pass was not watered by blood as the Lord of Ashmouth strode at the head of a small host of powerful demons. The Angels of Dusk watched from their cliffsides as Liza strode from a host of her own, the two leaders coming to a stop at a table placed between the two forces. Neither Shilgengar nor Liza hid their intentions, knowing full well they were there to build the contract. For Shilgengar, it was to save Ashmouth and to prevent all that he had worked for from becoming lost. While for Liza, it was to prevent the church from extinguishing an entire race, a sin that only Liza and her flight seemed to hold as egregious. The meeting was long, as each point of the contract was argued over, the pros and the cons being weighed by both sides as each proposal was made. The arguments were made as the war continued to wage just a few mountains over. The meeting turned plural, as days would draw to an end with no final agreement being made. However, through months of negotiation, a contract for peace was made. Liza and Shilgengar were now bound by their word in magic. Liza, jubilant to have brought an end to the war, returned to Thraben to reveal her secret works to her sisters, and to prove the results of her labor to Avison. However, when the time for the meeting came, Liza did not receive the reaction she had hoped. Her sisters, shamed into silence, did little as Avison's patience finally broke. Only a protest came from Singardia when Avison's wrath turned to fury, and none of her sisters stood to defend her when Avison, the god of Innistrad, attacked. The battle was brutal and unforgivingly short, Avison accusing Liza's delusions to have finally turned to heresy, claiming that she was no better than the Skirtstag cultists, as she now was beholden to a demon. No, no, not her alone. The entire flight of dusk were no more than fallen angels due to this contract. Despite Liza's pleas, no sister came to aid her. And despite Liza's reasonings, Avison's blade did not relent. Even as her flight of dusk were cut down as they defended their creator from the very being they worshipped, the words of Avison's father echoed endlessly within her head, as one feathered form after another fell still. Protect the realm from all threats, from within and from without. The slaughter only ended when Liza and her entire flight lay dead in what was once the Cathedral of the Sisters. An example made to the world that Avison's church would allow no evil to exist unanswered and tolerate no peace as long as there were still foes to vanquish. Liza's tragedy slowly turned to legend. When her name no longer served as a warning, then it became forbidden 
the many great acts done for humanity by Eliza and her flight of dusk were either attributed to Avison or lost to history itself. Slowly, Liza's existence was even scrubbed from history to erase the idea that you could make a deal with darkness. Now, whenever the tale of the four sisters is told around a rowdy bar table or a quiet forest campfire, the last sister to give her name to humanity is always Avison. Only the remaining sisters themselves could say otherwise. And though she might wish not, the memories of Liza deeply trouble one of the sisters to this day.